Welcome to this bonus episode featuring the inaugural Translate Science panel discussion. Translate Science is an all-volunteer community of interest for multilingual open science. The community supports gatherings of its members to share opportunities and perspectives about the many ways in which a more multilingual and open scientific enterprise can be achieved. For more information about Translate Science, please visit translatescience.org. All right, so we should be recording now. And that's a good transition into this small code of conduct information that we have for everybody. Um, so we're a community of interest for multilingual open science, and we want to make our spaces safe um, and ensure that we're including uh, as many different voices as possible. So if you have any concerns about um, what's happening in the chat or uh, concerns that you want to bring up, you can uh, private message one of the moderators. That's either me or Carolina. Um, you should be able to find our names in the sidebar. Oh, yeah, Carolina is waving. I'm waving, too. <laughs> um, but, you know, very simply, like I tried to summarize our code of conduct. You can see the full code of conduct on our wiki page, which I think I can put into the public chat right now. Uh, but also by QR code here, uh, we expect everyone to show respect for others. And so that means practicing empathy, assuming good faith, engaging in constructive feedback, and respecting the way that the contributors name and describe themselves. And we won't tolerate any abusive or unwelcome behavior. Uh, so saying things that are explicitly racist, sexist, homophobic, and are deliberately attempting to make others feel bad will result in immediate removal from this, from this space. Okay, so I think I can probably propagate a layout now where... It's just us. And close that presentation, put it to the side. You can still you know, move it around if you'd like. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I'd like to let you all know that uh, we're, yeah, we're this all volunteer community group that was founded by the late Victor Venema, who identified a need for multilingual science in their field of climate homogenization. And so after that, after a couple, I guess, months maybe of working in that group, we went through this open life science program and began to define ourselves as a community of interest um, and also create some more formal structures, including this biweekly core contributor meeting. And so what you're attending today is sort of the product of uh, those core contributors that we put together, something that we hope to help folks understand some of the work that we feel needs to be amplified and shared within our community to recognize um, that, you know, there are many different facets to this work in multilingual open science, uh, and we hope to share some perspectives today. Um, we also recognize that, you know, this, this is our first time running an event. Um, there might be little kinks that we have to work out. We, we're open to feedback in many different forms. Um, this is like only one modality that we're sort of experimenting with in order to reach people, but we recognize that with greater capacity, we may also think about trying to translate the recording of this uh, maybe post it on our blog post. We haven't explored those options yet, but if anyone has suggestions, they're welcome to reach out. And so to begin, I'd just like to introduce our presenters. Uh, I'm just going to read their bios from our event. We have two presenters today. Our first is Lynn Boker, a PhD and full professor at the School of Translation Interpretation at the University of Ottawa, an incoming Canada Research Chair in Translation Technologies and Society at the University Laval. She's the director of the Machine Translation Literacy Project and the author of open access book, Demystifying Translation. She's also a certified French English translator specializing in scientific and technical translation. You can find more details about her publications and other activities on her LinkedIn and ORCID pages. And our second presenter we have is Emma Stegerwald, a conservation genomicist interested in understanding how forces like climate change and emerging infectious diseases impact the evolutionary demographic trajectories of populations, particularly in amphibians. She's currently a postdoctoral scholar at the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Santa Cruz, California, Santa Cruz, where she was just awarded um, uh, where she was just awarded a fellowship, the University of California's Chancellor Fellowship. She recently finished her PhD at UC Berkeley and her dissertation fieldwork and outreach in the high Andes, um, or her dissertation and fieldwork was in, in the high Andes, contributed her interest in um, making access to scientific careers and scientific findings more equitable. So we're both, we're happy to have you both to speak today. Uh, and we're hoping that 
we'll have like three orienting questions to just give a sense of uh, yeah, what your work is and, and how it interacts with this community. So maybe we'll start with Lynn first. Um, I'm curious to know uh, what is your role in the world of science? Well, thank you. Thanks for the invitation to be here today. Um, I'm really excited to learn more about your group and, and to get this conversation going or keep it going, really, and try to amplify it a little bit. Um, my role in the world of science, well, as uh, you mentioned, I'm actually a translator. Um, I translate from French into English primarily. I can also do some Spanish to English. Um, but my specialization within translation is in uh, scientific and technical texts. And um, I also teach some courses on terminology, which is about developing resources like glossaries or databases of specialized terms. So it's basically like dictionaries, but of terms that belong to specialized fields of knowledge. And another key area of my teaching and research is the use of technologies for translation. So that ranges from everything like terminology management tools, like how do, how do we manage these online dictionaries, um, through concordancers, which are tools like Lingui, if you've ever used that tool online, that's a concordancing tool, um, all the way through to more automated solutions like machine translation. Um, today, that's neural machine translation. And of course, uh, what everyone's talking about are these AI-based large language model tools, which can also translate to some degree. So I'm, I'm sort of, those are my main areas of teaching and research. Um, but I thought I might share with you something that uh, people outside the translation industry might not realize is the extent to which translators do specialize. So I don't do legal translation. I don't do literary translation. And most translators are not able to translate just any text that you put down in front of them. Um, you know, they really do specialize. So I'm a scientific and technical translator. And the reason that they have to specialize is because, uh, well, translators don't really focus on translating the words so much as they focus on translating the message, which is like the concepts or the ideas that are expressed in a text. And in order to translate them, you really need to understand them like deeply. You really need to um, make sure that you understand what the text is about in order to transfer that properly into another language. And no translator, no person, in fact, can understand understand every single subject out there. Um, and so translators specialize out of necessity a little bit because it's impossible to know everything, um, but also so that they can do a good job because you, you need to restrict your coverage. Um, and something else that people might not realize about translators is the extent to which they need to be really good researchers. They have to develop research skills um, and, you know, they need to know how to find information on the topic of the text, how to evaluate the sources that they find to know if they're reliable or not, if they're uh, appropriate for the text that they're translating. And you know, translators don't necessarily have a degree in both translation and their subject of specialization, although quite a few do actually. So you might find translators who have a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Translation, for example, or vice versa. In my case, I have a Bachelor's of Translation and a Master's in Computer Information Science. So, um, you know, even if they don't have a degree, though, in the other subject, they, they really do need to get to know it very well, and they need to be good at researching what they don't know uh, so that they can become a kind of mini expert on something. And that helps to explain a little bit why translation can sometimes appear to people to be a bit expensive. Sometimes people are a little bit shocked at how much translation costs um, and why it can also be a little bit time consuming. Um, but you're paying for the translator's subject expertise and research skills as much as you're paying for their linguistic expertise, uh, because that makes a huge difference to quality. So I just wanted to throw that out there to sort of socialize a bit about, you know, what it means to be a translator and what what type of information a translator actually needs to have. It goes yeah. way beyond words and language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for providing that context. I, I mean, it's very helpful to hear that background, especially considering that you are a, a translator, right, as, as well as a professor. So yeah. that context is very helpful to understand. Uh, Emma, can you share with us a little bit about your role in the world of science? 
Yeah, um, what a brilliant introduction uh, Lynn gave to why translation um, is still such an important conversation despite the presence of so many tools we now have to do translation in an automated way. It's still um, a really important um, field to be kind of aware of and um, well-versed in. Um, I am a geneticist. I do conservation work and I was very lucky to start out my career in research, uh, getting to do a lot of field work. Uh, and um, I, I've done kind of long stints of field work in Spain, in Mexico, uh, in Ecuador, and then for my dissertation in Peru. And uh, so doing this field work, uh, obviously I've been working, you know, side by side with really brilliant local conservation practitioners and scientists um, who many times are facing barriers to accessing information that is so much more readily available to me as an English language speaker kind of with high proficiency because it's the first language I learned. Um, and so the ways in which uh, kind of limited access to science can affect how um, effective conservation can be, you know, it's, it's, it's a crisis discipline like um, climate science, like uh, Danny was talking about earlier, like, you know, epidemiology, a study of pandemics and things. There's so many reasons why we want people to be able to access information in a way that is very readily accessible to them as immediately as possible. Um, so I've confronted that um, idea first in all the various field experiences I've had. And then, of course, just, you know, being at universities, um, uh, science is uh, a very international endeavor. And so even within my university, you know, maybe it's, you know, any university maybe is still not uh, as diverse and representative as it should be of kind of a general population. But um, but still, I, I you know have many colleagues who, uh, um, who come from having spoken a different language first. And often in order to be able to get to an institution like Berkeley or Santa Cruz, uh, one of the first barriers they have to be able to pass is English language proficiency, which doesn't necessarily correlate at all to one's abilities as scientists, right? All of us have kind of different kinds of things that we're talented at. Um, and so there are many people who are excellent scientists who should be able to go to really incredible institutions um, anywhere they like um, and specialize in, in um, disciplines that they're really talented in, but might face barriers because they simply don't have the um, English language proficiency. And so, um, yeah, as, uh, a scientist, I run into these questions a lot, um, and I, uh, I, I guess I'll I'll save more discussion of this for um, for future questions. But um, yeah. I would like to help address uh, these issues in in my career. Thanks, thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, so let's go back to Lynn, and uh, we're curious on how you bring open science values to your role as both a professor and as a translator. <laughs> That's a, it's a great question and one that I'm trying to get better at. I think I have evolved a lot over the course of my career. Um, I actually was introduced to open science through open software initially. Um, because one of the things that we like to offer our students um, who are learning to become translators is the opportunity to work with different types of software tools. and some of them are very expensive. A lot of the commercial packages are beyond the means of an individual student and even beyond the means of a, of a university department in an arts faculty. You know, we're not the richest faculty on campus. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we like is to expose students to different tools as well. So even if you can afford to buy one of the commercial packages, you don't know what the students are going to be working with when they graduate. And also, you know, one of the best ways to learn about a tool is to be able to compare pair two or three different tools that are aimed at doing the same thing because you know maybe they approach it differently or they have some different features and of course that was way beyond the budget of our department to buy you know 50 licenses for three different tools that all do the same thing that there was it was hard to justify that expense 
So I became uh, interested quite early on, like in the 1990s, in open software and, and resources that we could have that would make it possible for our students to be able to use and evaluate different tools. And then from open software, I went really into open educational resources. And, um, you know, as a student myself, I struggled sometimes to make ends meet. Uh, textbooks are one uh, huge expense for any student. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe it would be possible to create resources that would be not quite so expensive. But although the cost is a is a sort of immediately visible thing, I also realized that um, uh, I am Canadian. I live and work in Canada. And all of the resources that I could find for my students were um, primarily in uh, a dominant variety of English or French. So it was easy to get textbooks in American English or UK English or in French from France. And, you know, I work and live in Canada. My students work and live in Canada. And we didn't have anything that was in Canadian English or in Canadian French. And they are different, sometimes in subtle ways, but they're different. And so I thought, you know, the open educational world is a great um, empowering opportunity to allow people to have resources in their own language or their own language variety. And so I have created a few now or adapted some. I started by adapting and then now I've created a few of my own um, open educational resources that focus on Canadian English and Canadian French for translators who are going to be living and working in Canada. And I, I just really like that part of the open movement that it that it does allow people who are not in the center to still have resources. You know, a lot of the commercial products focus on this, the central uh, languages or the central kind of schools of thought. And, and the open movement really allows those people who are on the peripheries and are not well served by existing resources to, to have access to some things. So, so from open software, I went to open educational resources. And now as a researcher, I'm trying to be more informed and more active in um, open access as well, trying to publish more of my work in open access journals um, and in cases where I'm not able to publish in open access to at least self archive my work in the institutional repository and make sure that people have better access to it um, to through through those various means. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like um, <laughs> that sounds like very important work. And, and something that I, that just I heard when you were speaking is like there's also this labor of like just because the things are open doesn't mean that the labor has gone in to make sure they're accessible in all these different languages. And that's like a big barrier. And, um, you know, we had originally contacted both of you got both of you off of a paper that we had read um, called uh, Overcoming. Well, let's see, I think I wrote it down on the side here. Overcoming Language Bearers in Academia, Machine Translation Tools, and a Vision for a Multilingual Future. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, it's interesting to hear these ideas, like, you know, right now, um, because, you know, it, it seems very important to ensure that the incentives, I think in the paper you spoke a bit about, like, changing incentive structures about those types of things. And Emma, you're our first author on that paper. Um, you could probably speak a bit more to it than I could, but I'm also interested to hear from you. How do you bring open science values in, into your work? Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I guess that paper came out of a working group um, that started at the Museum uh, of Vertebrate Zoology uh, at UC Berkeley that was dedicated to thinking about um, translation in science and how we can use translation to make science um, more accessible both to the readership and to the people producing science and the people who need to use it in policy and decision making. Um, and um, I think our, our first activity as a working group was to put together an undergraduate seminar course that I think was really interesting and important that was dedicated to um, the idea of science translation and uh, took place in the Department of Integrative Biology and gave students in integrative biology the opportunity to translate a uh, work of science, um, an important work in ecology or evolution uh, into either another language or into what we call plain language English. Um, 
and that course was um, just trying to both uh, uh, communicate the larger issues uh, at play, like why is it that we need to make um, science open to a larger readership, um, and also helping students kind of learn some of the, the tools for implementing this for themselves in, in future. Um, so we've gone on to do kind of a number of other things, um, include, uh, including uh, funding a small grants program within the department that was basically for graduate students to be able to translate, again, their science either into plain language or into some kind of outreach um, effort that would help communicate their science to a, a broader audience. Sorry, my cat really wants to contribute to this conversation. I don't know if you can hear him. Um, and um, uh, uh, yeah, so basically funding all sorts of small communication type um, programs within our department, um, which is something that seems important and, and kind of uh, scalable, like usable across other departments at other universities. Um, you know, actually providing explicit funding to help people do outreach or translate their work into to plain language or translate it into other languages would be brilliant because this is something I was really interested in as a graduate student. And I applied for funding to do outreach work. I had created a uh, Spanish language comic book to translate the science I was doing to uh, children in the indigenous communities I was passing through during my field work. So it was a comic book all about frogs and toads and the diseases that they deal with um, locally uh, that I was researching and about how climate change was affecting them and how climate change is just generally in uh, affecting the environment um, uh, in that area. And it was representing local um, culture in, in the way that the characters um, were dressed, were speaking. We worked with local scientists to, to make sure that this was kind of um, something that people would feel very represented when they read it. And um, I could not get it funded. I uh, I applied. There just there are not very many outreach grants out there, and largely it's kind of large organizations and groups that are applying for them. Me as a little graduate student, I I uh, in the end uh, could not get this funded, and I ended up paying myself to print uh, 500 copies of this comic book and distribute it because I cared about it so much and we've invested so much work into doing this. Uh, and I don't regret it at all. I know you're not supposed to do that as a graduate student because actually for many of these children, it was the only book that they owned because the other books they had were maybe one or two books that they borrowed in their district. It was their only book and they were so excited. Um, but um, Anyway, so funding this sort, like having these small grant programs available in departments um, uh, is something I really enjoyed helping to do uh, uh, for integrative biology at Berkeley, uh, but it's also something that I could see working uh, across many other institutions. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I, I'm sorry. I guess I derailed this a little. I, I, it's a great story and very interesting to hear like how the work of that paper like kind of got extended and the sort of um, an example <laughs> of of where like if the incentives don't align well, it's it's hard to do this work and have that work reach like a, a, a larger audience. Um, so the other question that we have and maybe I will just stay with you, Emma, like, can you speak a bit more about bringing multilingualism to your role um, and maybe again, a little bit on the open science values that might inform the things that you do. I, I mean, I think what you said was an illustrative example, but I just wanted to make sure that you had the time to, to speak about that a little bit more if you wanted to. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so um, science is relevant to everyone, everywhere in the world, but you know, I think it's 98% of people in the world are not um, native English speakers. And so multilingualism is a really important part of open science. Um, so, uh, ways that I'm trying to practice this kind of as an individual scientist, um, is ensuring that, uh, there is, uh, at the very least a translated abstract to any work that I publish, um, presenting, um, both in the areas where I do my field work at scientific institutions, um, and in the local language, um, 
is is one way that um, I tried to do that. Um, of course, working and collaborating with local scientists, particularly on work that is very relevant um, uh, for local decision making. Um, there's been an opportunity at a scientific conference that I attend regularly, um, Evolution, to contribute to a bilingual mentoring program where basically um, someone who is most proficient in a language other than English is paired with someone who is most proficient at English. Um, for the conference, both you know people enter into a voluntarily um, and support each other, uh, which has been a great experience. I've done this um, just two years now, but um, just to give you a range of ideas as to the kind of support someone who isn't um, uh, doesn't feel very comfortable with English might need at a conference. Um, in the first case, uh, the speaker just wanted to run through their talk a few times and ask, like, are there any are there any things that weren't understandable, you know, and, and get that kind of feedback. In the other case, it was someone who's presenting a poster and just was really scared to be left alone in front of the poster in case they couldn't understand a question that they received. Um, and in the end, like, didn't need any help from me in that particular case, but just having kind of a security blanket, someone who could be there specifically to help with access was able to allow this person to just kind of feel more comfortable at the conference and um, feel like they had a backup plan. Um, but yeah, and then, um, yeah, obviously publishing open access, the idea that uh, our literature is behind a paywall um, is is uh, mind boggling. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Um, and back to Lynn, uh, how do you bring multilingualism into your role? Um, as a professor, as, as a translator? <laughs> well, I guess translators are, are by, by definition kind of people who work with multiple languages, um, but I do work at um, a, a fully bilingual university, which is uh, kind of an interesting model. It has a lot of advantages. It also comes with some challenges. Bilingualism and multilingualism are not necessarily easy um, things to implement. And so, um, you know, just to like be aware of that, we we all, I think, have, um, you know, kind of like in principle love the idea of multilingualism, but it actually can sometimes be kind of challenging to implement. And so it's great to be having conversations like this and getting, um, you know, hearing about other people's experiences and sharing tips and, you know, maybe looking for ways to kind of move this forward because some of the barriers are, are you know, substantial in some cases to how to implement it. Um, so one of the things that I um, am quite passionate about is, is technology for translators. And so I kind of started a, a research project, um, which I call the Machine Translation Literacy Project. And maybe I could just pop the link in the, sorry, in the chat there. And basically what I wanted to do was help people to um, learn more about translation technology and how it can be useful and how we can be sort of savvy about it and make it, you know, work better for us. And so I started this project on machine translation literacy. And as I started working on it, I realized, wow, actually I kind of went too far down the line to begin and that a lot of people don't know very much about translation and you know fair enough like you're, you're studying something else you're studying biology you're studying chemistry why should you be an expert in translation so then i said okay before we get into machine translation literacy maybe we need some like translation literacy and so um that's sort of where i i have kind of um i did it backwards unfortunately but now i'm, I'm trying to learn and and do a little bit better so now i have recently published an open access book called Demystifying Translation. So anyone who's interested in learning a little bit about translation can um, hopefully get some, some information from this book. And then I think that makes it easier when you have a little bit of an understanding about translation, it makes it easier for you to move on and understand a bit more about translation technology and what its strengths are, but also what its limitations are. 
and how, again, how we can interact better with these tools to sort of make them work for us in a way, um, you know, that, that will give us better results. And um, Emma has already mentioned one of the, the things that people may not immediately realize, but is really relevant, is this idea of, um, you know, maybe plain language, writing in a way that is quite clear and, you know, um, unambiguous, because for translators, whether they're people or, or tech tools, um, ambiguity is really the source of all the problems. And, you know, as people, when we're in a conversation, we can use a lot of other cues to disambiguate, you know, um, when we're in, in a conversation with someone. And those cues are not there for tools. So we need to really try to make our text as clear as possible. And um, if we can do that, if we can sort of improve the input to these tools, then we also have a better chance of improving the output. Output. So that's one thing that, you know, people might not realize is that a lot of people might be reading your text through translation. You might not have thought about that, but now you should think about that. And to say you, I mean, everyone, all of us, when we're writing our research, we should just really try to be really clear in how we express it. Because somebody out there might be accessing our research through a machine translation tool. And so if we can write it in a clear way, then their translation of, of that is going to be more comprehensible for them. So that's one um, one kind of, you know, thing that we don't necessarily think about, but I think we all should. And I one of the things I like about this is that it also puts responsibility on English speakers to be part of the solution for this. You know, at the moment, um, we find that machine translation, I, I did a... Um, another research paper with um, uh, Philip Sayeni and Emmanuel Kolchitsky recently that was a, kind of a systematic review of the literature of how people are using machine translation for scholarly communication. And what one of the main things that we discovered uh, in this review was that machine translation is being used to kind of prop up or reinforce English as the language of scholarly communication. That uh, people are using machine translation as a writing aid. So non-native speakers of English are using machine translation to help them write in English so they can publish in English, so people will read their work in English. And it's still all about English. And that's really frustrating because a better use of machine translation is actually not as a writing aid, but for reading. If you think about the fact that when you're reading research, you're reading it typically in your own area of expertise. So you are able to bring your own subject knowledge to bear when you're reading a text. And you know, if that text is not perfect, you can often fill in the gaps because you're a subject expert. So if you are, for example, I'm just going to say if you are a native speaker of of Arabic and you take a text that's written in English, but in your subject field and you put it through a machine translation system. So now you have an Arabic version of the text in a subject that you know very well and Arabic is your native language. You've got a much better chance of, you know, making sense of that text, of using that text well because you're a subject expert and because you know the, the language. So even if the translation is not 100% perfect, it's probably quite usable in that context. But if you flip that around and have that same researcher who's an Arabic speaker, um, but who's now using machine translation to try and write an English language text, wow, that's all of a sudden much harder. English is not their strongest language. So they're going to get a less than perfect machine translation and they're trying to patch it up in their second or maybe their third language. And they don't necessarily know all the terminology in that language. And they don't maybe even know the grammar that well. I mean, that's how people are using machine translation, but it's not the best use of machine translation. But this is where we need to start um, you know, kind of influencing that value system, that incentive system that you mentioned, Danny, where we have, you know, all of the rewards are going to people who publish in English in the sense that international journal means English language and that's prestigious and maybe that's what's going to get you tenure or maybe that's what's going to get you a research grant. And we have to kind of take that 
privilege away from English and say, no, wouldn't it be great if we could all publish in our own language and then use these tools to read things that people have written in other languages? For me, that would be the ideal. I don't think we're going to get there overnight, but things like plain language can be a good stepping stone towards that goal where, okay, even if for the moment we're still publishing mainly in English, couldn't we at least be considerate and make it a trans translation friendly text that other people could access? So yeah, those are just some of my thoughts on that, but I, I feel like I'm starting to hog all the airtime. So I'm going to end because I'm sure Emma has good things to add and that there might be some questions to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. It's nice to hear um, this potential vision, right, that we could have and, and in, in using the tools that we have, but maybe uh, in a more effective way that that sort of respects the expertise that exists amongst like, you know, our very diverse research base that's out there in the world. <clears throat> um, okay, so th those are the three questions that we had prepared, but uh, for the rest of the time of this uh, panel, we'd like to open up questions to the audience. Um, I think Carolina had already written in the chat that uh, if you have a question, you can DM her uh, specifically, or you can write it in this uh, shared notes document that we have at the, in, in the sidebar. Um, if the person who wrote the first question wants to unmute themselves and ask the question themselves, they're, they're free to. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll ask it. Oh, okay, Oliver, great. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Emma. Thank you, Lynn, for, for, your, for your thoughts and everything you said so far. And there's so many true things in there, but I'll try to stick to my question. Um, so, uh, Lynn, you already mentioned machine translation literacy and the idea of uh, or the question of how much machines can help us to become more multilingual. What I'd be interested in, and I would actually like to start with Emma, so with someone who doesn't have a, a translator background in, in, in that sort of in the narrow sense, um, what sort of, uh, well, I would call it translation competences, or, or let's rephrase it, what, which sort of um, tips or, or what kind of knowledge or uh, what else would you have liked to have when you started working into that direction? Where did you think like, okay, if I want to translate, I think I should really know about this and then maybe pass on to Lynn. Um, yeah, so one is um, kind of uh, where my motivation is at or where my head is at when thinking about translation. Uh, so I think, uh, so the, the paper that um, that Danny brought up and then and Lynn also um, referenced back to our um, overcoming language barriers, uh, a vision for a multilingual future in science or, or whatever, like the title talks about a vision for a future. And the reason for that is I think one of the one of the best mind um, state shifts that happened for me as we were working on this paper was thinking about um, it, in the way that Lynn was talking about kind of building for the future uh, with the actions that we're taking now. So someone had commented um, in the chat about how, well, you have to publish in English in order to be visible, right, um, as a scientist, because that's what most people are reading and that's what most people are citing. And if you don't publish in English, then um, that a lot of the high impact journals are in English. Um, and and yeah, no one is going to be, or, or very few people are going to choose to kind of publish against their interests and against their careers. Um, uh, if they have that opportunity to publish in whatever that higher impact journal is. But if we, uh, so this is the mind state shift, providing that human verified um, abstract translation for your discipline, for your very particular subject area is providing training data so that in one day, at, at some point in the future, uh, machine translation tool will be able to perfectly translate that text, right? We're not like that far away. It's that the machine translation tools need more training data in our very specific disciplines. So by translating our abstracts, we're not only opening up our science to many other readers who might otherwise um, not see it or um, just decide, oh God, this is giving me a headache. I, I can't read this today. Um, right, but we're also um, providing training data to make the tools better so that one day 
that's totally not necessary. Um, and in the same way, like Lynn was talking about, writing in plain language today means that your science will be able to be more perfectly translated in future when the tools kind of catch up a bit more. So that mind state shift was something I wish I had realized a little bit earlier. Um, yeah, I think I think that's the main thing. Um, I guess I'll also just emphasize this aspect of um, human verified. We want um, machine translation tools to be trained with really, really high quality um, data. And so just putting out a machine translated text and saying, here's my translated abstract and not putting any kind of um, footnote that says, you know, by the way, this is just machine translation, translated, no human has fixed this, um, is something I think we should also be aware of. Um, so um, if you can, if you have a collaborator who speaks another language, if you speak another language um, with high proficiency, uh, if you have someone who can verify a text, even if you machine translation, translate it first, um, that's a really um, important uh, step to take to make sure that um, we're training our tools with the best possible data. Thanks for that. Uh, Lynn, do you have anything to add, like something that would be helpful at the beginning, maybe maybe at the beginning of your journey or that you see in folks that are trying to do this work, some some tips? Yeah, I mean, I think this community is probably already in this mindset, but just to follow up on what Emma said about training data, um, you know, things that are behind a paywall are not available for training. And so uh, open science publishing is also part of the solution to getting these tools to be improved because open you know, publications are available for to be in, incorporated into training data for these tools uh, in a way that paywall data is not. And so just by publishing your work in open access, you are already taking steps to help uh, with the situation. And if you can publish it in multiple languages, that will help even more. Um, yeah, I think for me, what I hadn't realized uh, so much in the beginning was how difficult it would be to shift these values structures. And so I have recently um, joined a couple of uh, working groups. Um, they're both based in Europe uh, because Europe is even more multilingual, I think, than North America. Um, and so they've uh, got some um, groups. Uh, one that I've joined is called Koara, and it's a, a group, a coalition um, to advance research assessment. And it's basically about how do we assess research. And I've joined in particular the working group on multilingualism. And it's sort of like, as, as we've been discussing, like, if there's no incentive to publish in your own language, or if in fact it will even be perceived as potentially harmful because you won't get cited or you won't get tenure, then how, you know, what, why, why could we expect people to, to do that, to publish in other languages? So I've realized that, that, you know, the technology alone is not going to save the day. It can help. It can be a huge help, but until we can shift some of these policies and value structures away from, you know, rewarding only um, English, and and I shouldn't pick on English because that just happens to be the language that we're using now, but in the past it's been other languages. It's this idea of any language being used as the single language of science or publication. So it's not because it's English that it's problematic. It's because there, we've decided to reward the use of one language, a single language. So um, yeah, so my, my more recent efforts have been um, trying to um, affect some policy changes or to work at that level because technology is great and can be very helpful, but it, it is not alone the solution. And that paper that I mentioned kind of shows that at the moment, English is being propped up by machine translation. People are using these tools only to kind of publish in English, and that's not what we want to see. Um, mm -hmm. So we have to kind of tackle it at multiple levels at the same time. We should still work on improving the technology, but we also need to think about some of these policy shifts um, mm -hmm. in, in concert with that. Yeah, 
great. Um, I, I want to ask a question that I saw in the chat because I think it's pulling in like just another aspect that we haven't explicitly talked about. Um, the question is, what is the importance of translation features or tools on platforms like Zooniverse or other citizen science portals? Do you believe that more translation features and tools would incentivize or increase citizen science participation? <laughs> Whoever feels they can speak first. <laughs> um, I, I do think tools are a huge part of the solution. If we can make it easy for people to translate, then they will be more likely to translate. Um, I think, though, what uh, Emma emphasized was was also important. That I mean, we don't just want to be in a situation where we think that just clicking the translate button is sufficient. I think that we do still need to make sure that it's part of a bigger process, that at some point down the line, uh, the translation will be checked or, you know, kind of it's, it's part of a, a bigger system that just pushing the translate button is not enough. Um, but certainly, uh, yeah, the better we can equip people to to do translation with tools and resources, then, um, you know, that that's part of the package for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, um, community science projects and, um, you know, apps that uh, people can use to contribute to um, community science efforts uh, are just an, an amazing learning opportunity. And yeah, certainly having a translate feature is a band-aid um, for some future in which kind of more nuanced multilingual platforms um, hopefully would be available. Um, but um, yeah, I think uh, not having those learning opportunities open uh, to to everyone, um, no matter what their uh, language proficiency um, may be uh, in in different languages, um, is would be a, a huge shame not not to have that be open. Um, but it's also a huge shame for science because um, I was just watching a talk this last Friday where someone had informed their sampling um, scheme for butterflies across. Um, Africa and uh, much of, I think, Southern Asia using iNaturalist data. Uh, but often, of course, if you're looking at iNaturalist data, um, there are, uh, you know, hotspots that are really associated with um, often English language proficiency um, because the platform is, is in English. Um, and uh, but I thought that was amazing that they were able to do that. And wouldn't it be more amazing if because they were looking at lots of phenotypic diversity within butterflies. So it was really important. They had good records across the range they were looking at. Um, so uh, it would also help science and um, different uh, crisis disciplines if if we had better data from those mm -hmm. platforms. Um, actually, there's a question for you, Emma. Uh, in the shared notes. I'm not sure if the person that wants to ask it would unmute. I think they both, I think they wrote both five and six. Um, no unmute. So I, I'm just going to ask it just for her expediency. Uh, Emma, when distributing your work to local students in Spanish, did you encounter any students who primar whose primary language was not Spanish? And were there any considerations regarding publishing the comic in local indigenous languages? Yeah, my initial plan was to publish the comic book in Quechua, which is the language that students start learning. Um, and uh, it's about the age of four or five before those students feel confident enough to start actually speaking um, in Spanish. And there's also like a like um, sex or, or gender, I should say, a gendered um, issue here where uh, I experienced that girls uh, were less likely to feel comfortable kind of communicating in Spanish um, than than boys, um, actually more so kind of with increasing age, um, funnily enough. Uh, so my initial hope was to publish in Quechua until I actually did field work and realized that for various, well, one, Quechua was never like a written language and the written component of Quechua came later, but two, you know, due to that this is not just true of Peru and the Andes, but true of so many places in the world. Um, uh, indigenous local languages have been uh, devalued or de-emphasized or often intentionally erased. 
Um, and so children did not have, there was one community we went to uh, out of seven that I did, um, that I did outreach in that students had textbooks in Quechua. Uh, but most of their textbooks were in Spanish. And even in that community, it was one book that they had that was available in Quechua. So students were not learning to read their language. Uh, but for the rest of the outreach, so it wasn't just like a comic book, we um, also did um, kind of a whole full day environmental education workshop. Uh, and I was working with um, uh, my, my translator from the local community and he led a lot of that workshop that we did together um, because he spoke Quechua. So I felt like he was better able to communicate orally with the students. Um, so yeah, that was certainly a consideration. I wish we could have published it in Quechua. That would have been super cool. Um, certain words we had to use in Quechua because the students don't know the word in Spanish, uh, but that's just certain words, like the word for tadpole, uh, hokoyo, or the word for each of the three different species. Like there is a word in Quechua that we would use and people just do not know the word in in Spanish because for those very specific terms, that's the way things are. So that was that was cool to be able to do that. Nice. Thanks for providing those extra details. Um, okay, so we have seven minutes left. I see a couple more questions. I think we'll start with um, what do you think of AI as a tool for scientific translations? Um, well, it is, it's, it's not that easy to answer because the tools at the moment are data driven. And so languages that are kind of widely used in the world have more data than languages that are not widely used and subjects that are, you know, more common, uh, have more data than subjects that are highly, highly specialized. And it gets very complicated because it's it's not just that a language needs to be individually widely used. It needs to be the language pair. Like the, There needs to be a lot of translation activity between those two languages. So we could think of a language like I mean, Russian, which has a, a yeah, fairly high number of speakers, and a language like Hindi, which has a, a very high number of speakers. But how much translation activity is there between Russian and Hindi? So we need that translation data. So it's not enough that it's independently a, a big language, but there has to be activity between those two languages. And it has to be about the subject that you want to translate and of the text type that you want to translate. So when we're talking about translating between English and Spanish, the chances are that the quality is decent because those are both widely used languages in and of their own right. And there's a lot of translation activity between English and Spanish. But if we get to languages like Danish and Greek, how much translation activity is there between Danish and Greek? They're already small languages themselves. There's probably not a ton of translation activity between them and probably not on very, very specialized topics. So the pool of data can shrink for various reasons. And the smaller the pool of data, the less good the AI translation will be because it's a data driven approach. And when, when I say it needs a lot of data, like I'm talking, it needs millions of texts, not hundreds, not thousands, millions of texts to do a good job. So it's, it's too general of a question to say, can we use AI for translation? or even translation of science. Like it, it has to be more nuanced. Like, yes, we can probably use it for introductory biology between English and Spanish, but we can't use it for, you know, like some highly specialized type of nuclear physics between Greek and Danish. So it, it, it's not a straightforward yes or no question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> um, the other, another question that comes up uh, and it's to circle back with something we've talked about, uh, this, the implications of this term plain English, um, when we're saying we want to make, um, we, we want to make sure that when we're writing our abstracts, they're in this sort of format that might be easy to translate that's unambiguous. But, um, how does that interact with this idea of like dialects and regionalisms within English, for example, black English? That's what the question says. Emma, do you want, do you want to go for that? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I can I can start out. So previously, Lynn was talking about um, 
you know, different registers are like having like a Canadian dialect English and about how the nuances may be subtle, but they're they're present. Um, and I think part of that is as a student, you know, reading your textbook or your curriculum, feeling represented in, in what you're reading or feeling like you could be the one producing that piece. And if you feel like it comes from a world that isn't your own, um, obviously you're going to see yourself less as a possible future scientist. So obviously this, this question of registers and dialects um, and kind of changing what is con considered acceptable is an important conversation. Um, uh, often, you know, when we're speaking about plain language for many people, you know, as they're writing science, what that actually means is kind of moving it away from maybe something that would seem more othering. So moving it away from kind of any kind of, uh, I don't know, um, uh, complex for no particular reason language. You know, you're you're often taking away jargon um, and you're using simpler words, shorter sentences that are kind of um, uh, just kind of generally more common across different dialects, right? Um, and um, I think the difficulty with regionalism is, again, if there are specific terms that aren't going to um, be understood by a broad, uh, a broad readership. Um, and um, so I guess it depends on the kind of text, right? So like plain language, I think technically wouldn't, wouldn't want you to use regionalisms for that reason, that a broad, a, a large part of your readership might not be able to understand it. Um, however, if by plain language you're talking about, hey, I want like to communicate my science in a casual way to the people that um, it's most relevant to or the people I would most like to communicate with, like absolutely using um, the dialect that would be appropriate or regionalisms that would be appropriate is like the best, most effective way um, to, to do that. Um, so I don't think it's like the technical definition of plain language or necessarily where we should be trying to move for um, our scientific writing in order to make sure that it's compatible with machine translation in the future. But for outreach work or just kind of communicating your science in a more casual way, um, I don't know, I think it's brilliant and to be encouraged. Yeah, I don't really have much to add. Emma got it all for all of the things that I would have said as well, that plain language, it's not meant to replace other types of language. It, it's like an, an in addition to, if we could also make things available in plain language, um, alongside, I mean, if you have to write a plain language abstract, it doesn't replace the scientific abstract that you have. It's an ad in addition to. And so, um, yes, plain language is not the first choice for every communicative context, but it can be one that can be very helpful in a case where people are trying to access the content of your work through translation or through reading in their second or third language, for example. So even if they're not using a translation tool, but if they're, if English is their second or third language, then reading your plain language English abstract would be probably um, easier for them than reading a non-plain language version. Yeah. Great. Um, all right. Well, uh, we're at time. It's one already. Uh, there is a final question in the chat, and I'll read it out loud just because I think it's nice to think about. And I think it's something that our group is concerned about. And that question is, what do you think is a good strategy to bring more multilingualism into science, scientific publications? Um, and we have touched on some of those threads, I think, in this discussion about incentives, about, right, um, yeah, just many of these different efforts. So I'm just going to make sure that people can see the presentation again because i just want to close out and first of all thank you lynn and emma for um agreeing to speak with us today it was really great to hear your insights um thank you to everybody who helped publicize this event because we have very minimal social media presence actually as a group we're on the fediverse um and we have a mailing list um and and we're just choosing these tools because they're very um privacy aware sort of light tools that don't collect too much data from folks. Um, but you know, if you believe in the work that we do, then please follow us on these two channels. And we'll always make sure to um, 
provide promotional images that you can send on whatever channels you'd like um, in, in terms of publicizing these events. Um, we want help and so like we're not sure what we'll do next. Hopefully we do more events like this, but we have many different possibilities. Um, if you're interested in contributing in any way, you can email us at info at translatescience.org. Um, and that's everything that I have to say today. So thank you again, uh, Lynn and Emma. Thank you to all the core contributors. Um, this was a great, a great presentation. I'm going to stop the presentation, the recording now. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys so much for hosting this event.